Welcome to Write Good, the podcast that helps you write good. I'm Raquel S. Benedict, the most dangerous woman in speculative fiction. In this episode, we are joined by the even moster dangerouser woman in speculative fiction, Gretchen Felker Martin. This is a special two part episode, part one, which is free for everybody. In this one, Gretchen will tell us how an idea becomes a book. And in part two, which is for book club members on our Patreon, we'll go into a little more depth about Gretchen's astonishing upcoming novel, Manhunt. So let's jump into part one and let's try and keep this one a relatively spoiler free, if possible. Yeah, I uh, think we can do that. Yeah, let's try. So Gretchen, thanks for joining us. What oh, is your book about? Thanks for having me. My book, Manhunt, is about a post-apocalyptic future in which a virus has transformed anyone with enough testosterone in their body into a ravening, mindless cannibal monster. So it's mimetic fiction. <laughs> yes. And it follows a group of trans and cis people as they navigate this hostile world. That is extremely cool. Let's start by talking about your history as a writer. I know that you've been writing fiction for years and years and self-publishing novels on Gumroad. You blog a lot. You've written nonfiction pieces for some online magazines. So even though this is your debut novel, you are not an overnight success, are you? my god no the heady quality of getting the fabled book deal certainly felt pretty wild in the moment but no i've been writing every day of my life since i was about 14 yeah and you've been grinding away just getting it out there since well since probably since 14 too i guess well let's see i started putting critical work online in, I want to say 2014, which is the year I came out. Mm. I'm sure that that had a lot to do with becoming more confident in my skin, but yeah. So I guess it's, it's been seven years coming up on eight since I first published anything. And that first year I was really publishing for peanuts you know, it was of course tiny little boutique websites for $2 for a 500 word article. Oh, wow. Yeah. Just nothing with like wow. token payment. Um, right. And I did not make any real money from criticism because that's what I was writing at the time until I think it was 2018. Wow. Yeah. yeah, four years of grinding away. Yeah, and and I was I was writing television and film reviews that whole time. Yeah, and um, you're you're in your thirties, right? It's it's so I weird because I see so many people who are like anxious. Like, apparently, some people feel anxious if they don't publish a book traditionally before they're thirty, which is that's very strange to me. That's nuts. Yeah, no, I'm I'm 32. Yeah. I feel like I wasn't a very good writer until my 30s. So <laughs> if I had published something in my 20s, it would have been shit. And I would have been embarrassed about it now. <laughs> I'd have to change my name and go into hiding. <laughs> fake my own death. Yeah, no, that was, you know, I'm, I'm Raquel Q. Benedict. You, uh, <laughs> you have me confused. Raquel Q. Benedict wearing a mustache and those glasses. 
Yeah, the, the, like, that's me. the Groucho face. I don't know who that other bitch is. She sounds hot but stupid. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and during this time I was making something of a living. I say that because I was like stealing to eat and often overdrafting to pay rent. I was copywriting and I, I did it for these sort of online mechanical Turk companies. It was one of the most soul crushing experiences I've ever had. I mean, these places you're either a literal cog or you're out the door and it, and it'll happen in the space of a second that they'll be like, well, you've had three articles in a row that got flagged and had to be rewritten. So you're fired. Did you find it made it harder to write creative stuff that mattered to you doing that job? I definitely struggled with a sense that I was pumping trash into the world and that weighed on me. And yeah. just like, I was also really mentally ill at the time. Ooh, a fun combination. Yeah, <laughs> which it was sort of a feedback loop. So yeah. I, I was not making a lot of work. I was still writing, but it was torturously slow. Right. I think I I didn't finish anything between No End Will Be Found in 2017 and then Dreadnought in 2019. Wow. Or, no, that was Ego Hominy Lupus, but either way. Yeah, that's two years. That's a long time. It is a really long time, especially because... When I was younger, I used to write pretty much a book a year. Um, and, and no one will ever read those books. Right. They are they are consigned right to hell. <laughs> yeah, it was um, a really challenging time for me creatively. Yeah, yeah, it sounds crappy. Dang. It sucked. It fucking sucked, you know, to to write literally all day just so I could scrape enough together to pay the electric bill, hopefully, and not have it be overdue and get hit by a fee. And yeah. then to try and make something that I really believed in and loved. It it just sucks. It's like yeah. it's like when you come in from the cold and you instantly get way more fucked up. Like your nose stuffs up and you can't breathe because the heat is so weird to your body. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, I'm glad you're not in that place anymore and, and doing way better. Christ, me too. Yeah. So so basically you support yourself, I understand, by just, just writing? You don't have a yeah. day job? I, I do not have a day job anymore. Oh. Yeah, it's, it's fucking wild. Yeah, that's crazy. That's great. I'm very lucky. Extremely lucky. Yeah, most of the writers I know have a day job. But, I mean, for me, my... I need a certain level of comfort, so I can't do that thing where I'm, I'm like, oh, I might not be able to pay rent next month. Like, nope, no, I will get it. I will have a day job. I can't. I can't handle that level of risk. It is terrible for your mental health and your physical. Oh yeah. Health. I think that being stressed about money chronically is one of the worst things I've ever gone through. I mean, I, I grew up without much. Yeah. Um, my family wasn't like living on the street or by any means, but we did not have a lot. And that got worse and worse and worse for me personally until about 2018. And I would, I was so consumed by anxiety that I would just lie in bed, totally unable to sleep thinking about what fresh hell tomorrow would bring. Damn because I had no idea how I was going to make it through another month or another week. Yeah. That sounds real fucking bad. Um, it, it was terrible for me. I was, I like lost a bunch of weight in a really fast, unhealthy way. Ooh. And it just generally was a, a wreck of a person. Yeah. And I was fortunate enough to start to build a little traction on Twitter around this time. And to have a couple of very good friends, Shanti Collins and Julia Graffer, who were really supportive of my critical work. Sean is a, a TV critic himself and 
is the reason that I got into writing about film. And Julia is a horror cartoonist who really inspired me to try my hand at writing horror, which I'd always loved, but you know, for some reason had never written. And they got my work in front of Matt Zoller sites, who is a, a well-known television critic who happened to like what he saw and passed it on to Matt Patches at Polygon, who gave me my very first paid piece. And then I wound up working for Merritt Kay, who is my longtime editor at this point, hmm. at the VRV blog, which was this weird little moment in time where Crunchyroll had like an online media write-up site. Hmm. Um, and yeah, it was, uh, it was basically a series of, of coincidences and advantageous connections. That's yeah. So one thing I do want to stress for, for listeners, I'm sure most of the, our listeners already know this, but there's no such thing as an overnight success unless you're the child or niece or mistress of somebody very well connected and rich. Yes. <laughs> the idea that my, by 24, you will, you will publish the big book and get a big deal. Like that's not going to fucking happen unless no. your dad works for Raytheon or something. <laughs> does not happen and I'm, I'm guessing the way you got to where you are is just you just kept fucking grinding i did rise and grind and i can't say that like working hard is a virtue i personally think it fucking sucks yeah but it is required if you yep. don't have sort of sort of high level publishing connections which most people don't because they're not parasitic scum <laughs> Yeah, I, I basically broke my back for years, almost a right. decade. Right. And I mean, I, I was working as a, a copywriter and just plugging away from 2011 onward. Oh. So it, it literally took a decade. Yeah. Um, and actually, I only got my book deal after I had completely given up on traditional publishing. Oh, wow. I, I queried in the 2010s, but after enough rejection, I just gave up. Yeah. But you did seem to have a, a lot of, uh, or at least a good bit of success, just self-publishing on Gumroad. Yeah. Gumroad was really fun for me. My friend Julia, who I mentioned a minute ago, encouraged me to publish my own stuff. That's what she does. She makes a lot of zines as well as working with Fantagraphics. And so I put out No End Will Be Found, which is a book about the Wurzburg witch trials in the 1600s. And it did well enough that I thought I would keep doing it. Yeah. And I just enjoy having my work read. It, it feels very affirming to me. Oh, yeah, it does. It's, it's, it's that good shit. You know, when someone is like, wow, I read this book and it really resonated with me. I'm like, fuck yes. That's right. Yeah. I'm, the, I'm the most important woman in the world. Yeah, when you see other people discussing your work and trying to interpret it, like, oh, oh. yes. Oh. Even even when people flip out about it and hate it, I'm like, mm, that's nectar to me, baby. Yeah. Um, I, I, my favorite is just trying to see people trying to puzzle it out and debating on it or are arguing about it when people are arguing each other about it. Like, Oh, yes. It's so good. It's so, mm. like when it means enough to multiple people that they'll have a disagreement about it. Wild. That's such a fucking good feeling. Ugh. So let's talk about Manhunt and just go step by step through the process of how you turned your idea into this book. I figure it's better to talk about your individual process than to try to give a how-to guide because no one really knows how the fuck to do anything anymore. Right. Nothing that works <laughs> for one person is going to work for everyone else. But Right. But I do think it could be helpful to hear how, how it worked for you. For sure. So let's just start with the idea. What was your inspiration? Well, I had finished writing Ego Hominy Lupus and had published it that year. I think this was 2019. And I was working on a book about flagellants during the plague in Italy. And one night, 
my dear friend, Alice Store, who's a fantastic author, read me The Screwfly Solution Ooh. by James Tiptree, which is about a fictional event in which all men become irresistibly driven to rape and murder women. Oof. And it's so fucking entrancing and exciting and bleak. And also it doesn't engage at all with the world that I live in, hmm. which is a world of poor people and disabled people and trans people and queer people. Hmm. It's very manifestly straight horror. And I don't think that takes away from it. I mean, it's a classic yeah. story for a reason, but it left me thinking, fuck, there's a lot of room there for someone to come in and retell this story in a way that it takes a whole different viewpoint. Oh, interesting. And I had also recently read Tori Peters' Infect Your Friends and Loved Ones, which is about a plague that causes everyone on earth to stop producing sex hormones. And I was just so excited by reading all this material about like gender and the end of the world that one night I had the idea, okay, what, what are trans women doing during all this? And yeah. how, how can I make a story that leaves people like me at the center? And I wrote out the first chapter pretty much the minute I had the idea, I spent like all day on it. And once that was done, I thought that I might have something with a little commercial appeal for the first time in my life. Yay. So I got in touch with Tom Horseman, who is one of my very favorite artists and did all the covers for my self-published work. And uh, by, by the way, this is just a straight up piece of writing advice. Find an artist you love. And if you're going to self-publish, invest in a good cover. Yeah. D just don't, just don't put out a piece of fucking shit. A generic, boring cover. Right. Either do words on black or pay someone. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, and Tom drew this incredible picture of a trans woman with blood all over her mouth. And I remember it was, it fucking killed me to wait for them to finish the drawing before I, I tweeted out the, the piece. But once I put it out on Patreon, it got a fair amount of traction which is actually how I got an agent. Hmm. That's how you, you, you didn't send your manuscript to people. You didn't submit. No, I was no? planning no. on, I was planning on self-publishing Manhunt, but the first chapter wound up in front of Connor Goldsmith from Fuse Literary. And he got in touch asking if I had representation and if I'd like any, and I checked him out and said, yes, I would. Wow. Yeah, it, that is living the dream when an when really an agent lucky. who's a legitimate agent yeah. approaches you, who's an actual <laughs> agent and not a bullshit artist scrolling through pit mad to find, you know, like a, a hawk looking for field mice. <laughs> um, yeah, Connor's, cool. been, Connor's been very good to me. Yeah, Thank yeah. All right. Well, now that we've talked about inspiration. Do you think that stories about the creative process can put a little too much emphasis on that initial inspiration, on that moment of eureka? Yes, absolutely. Pretty much all of my stories start with an image and then I, I build a plot outward from and around that image. So for instance, I wrote No End Will Be Found because I had this idea of a horse pulling a drowned woman out of a lake. And I thought, well, where can I put that? What does that go with? And at the time I was reading about the German witch burnings and, and well, mostly crucifixion. And so it all melted together into a book. And with Manhunt, really, I thought, well, what if there was a situation in which trans women had to eat balls? <laughs> and then I started building a story around that. <laughs> um, a, a thing about me is that my favorite art is anything where a woman gets blood all over her face. 
Oh, nice. There's some tweet that's like seeing a woman with blood on her face in a movie. This is the greatest film of all time. Oh, yeah. And that's how I operate. You know, it's like the more possession I can, I can get a story, the better I'm doing. Oh, nice. (laughs) But yeah, I think that people tend to be very precious about inspiration. Yeah. It, it leads to people getting worked up, kind of like waiting for the right idea. Man, fuck that. Just write whatever idea you have and then finish it. Maybe it'll suck. Maybe it won't. Right. And either way, you'll be a better writer at the end. And you can have the best idea, but you still have to fucking write it. (laughs) Oh my God. Yes. Don't forget that. I I think movies and interviews do such a bad job. Like any, any rock and roll biopic, there's the moment where our, our musician, our protagonist gets an idea. He he just starts muttering. Yeah, I will walk the line and then smash cut to (laughs) he's finishing the song in the studio and the song is released and it hits the top 40 charts. And we don't see the many, many, many hours in between where he's fucking with chord progressions and putting together lyrics and trying to figure out a decent rhythm and harmony and and backup vocals and shit. Like we don't see any of that. It's just, he gets the idea and then bam, there's a song. Like what, what happened in between? Yeah. What happened in between? That's that's where all the work is, and we never right. see that. Where's Probably because it's not fun or sexy to watch. I talk about this all the time, but Western media especially is extremely averse to showing work. Yeah. Which I think sucks. It's something that initially, when I was young, really drew me to Miyazaki movies, where everyone is constantly cleaning and cooking and building things, and it's so involved and takes up so much space. Right. Yeah, now that you mention it. And I find that extremely appealing. I love movies where people work. It's it's part of why I love movies about chefs and, and kitchens. Is that inevitably the most interesting thing to shoot is people making food. Right. But in general, I think that work is just as exciting to me and just as interesting as an action scene. Yeah. Or certain sex scenes. Right. It's different, but work is such a part of human existence. The bread has to get made. The babies have to get fed. The floors need to be cleaned. Right. And there's this kind of Zen-like beauty in, in it, some, depending on the work, obviously, and depending on yeah. the working conditions. But it can be incredibly satisfying to, I don't know, assemble some furniture or, or whatever. Yeah. I mean... So I've had a job since I was, I think, 13 when I was an office cleaner. Hmm. And since then, I've been a janitor and I've been on grounds crews and I've worked in a couple of kitchens and at a car wash and in a furniture warehouse. I've done so much repetitive, silent, solitary work. And I don't miss doing those things. They were tough on my body. But there is sort of a piece to it. Yeah. And a satisfaction to beginning and ending something that you can see the progression of. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we really, we underemphasize that so much in general and in the creative process. People, so many people want to be writers, but they don't want to write <laughs> yeah. at all. <laughs> people are, are really want to have written or yeah (laughs) yeah all of like hashtag am writing twitter is all people talking about how they're trying not to write how they're cleaning the house instead of writing and i i don't understand that mindset at all eat me god i don't understand it like are you sure you want to be a writer maybe you could do something else you could do something else like please do something else the pay sucks yeah you're the hours are long yeah there's very little satisfaction unless you really like writing. Exactly. The writing is the best part. The everything else about it kind of sucks. Yes, it does. I always think about my old teacher, Jane Hunt, who had, had met Isaac Asimov once. And at the time that she told me this, I was very into his books. I think I was about 15 or 16. Yep. And that I is the right you. age to be obsessed with Isaac Asimov. <laughs> yes. 
And I asked her, what was he like? And she was like, well, he really seemed like he wanted to go home and work. Yep. And I was like, yeah, man, that's going to be me. And lo and behold, it's me. Nice. For better and for worse. (laughs) Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about your writing process. How long did it take to write this? How many hours a day did you work? Did you have a schedule? Did you have a word quota or a time quota? Do you have a ritual that helps you get into the writing mood? So for Manhunt, I didn't have a set of of working hours on any kind of daily basis. But I would say that I average probably eight or nine hours a day on it. Wow. Yeah. And that, you know, that's a a fair amount of fucking around and. Oh yeah. Not doing anything of of much consequence, but. Right. Thinking about the book while you make yourself a snack. Yeah. A lot of that. That's part of the work, you know? Yeah. You also need to do nothing or watch movies or read books because your brain needs to eat. Yep. And. For the first stretch, before I had a contract, I was writing about 500 words a day. Wow, that's good. Yeah, that's that's been my watchword for years now. It's yeah. Just, just make 500 words a day. It's, yeah, I think uh, that's a healthy amount. It's like the protagonist of The End of the Affair, the Graham Greene novel. Maurice Bendrix is kind of a hack novelist, and he writes... 500 words a day and at the end of a year he has a book yep so that's what i was going for and then after i got the contract i had to speed up i I wound up doing about a thousand words a day for the final stretch yeah it was pretty grueling that's where i am now with my next book yeah so right about where in the in the draft did you get that contract and you did you get that speed up time like midway i think i was about a third of the way through oh okay So like about when they get to the screw kind of. Exactly. Okay. Interesting. Um, And that was as far as I had planned. I actually had never once in my life outlined a book until Connor told me that I needed an outline for us to sell it. That was going to be my next question. Did you write an outline? (laughs) Yeah, it's, it's not in my nature. And I think having an outline did help. Manhunt is definitely less episodic than my other books. It's less just sort of a string of things happening to the same characters but no in in my natural state i don't write them i don't enjoy them i see all right so did you have any kind of like ending in mind when you started or was it really not until the outline that was like okay i gotta actually plan the shit out yeah i had no end in mind at all oh okay (laughs) interesting well i did know one thing which is that i wanted a trans woman to stomp a turf's head in (laughs) <laughs> that is a noble goal. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I think so too. There's so much frustration in me from the way that sort of the current political landscape renders physical violence against TERFs less acceptable than, say, physical violence against Nazis. Right. And part of it is the way they weaponize their, like, white cisness. Yeah. Such that if someone hurts them, then that's fuel for the fire. Whereas right. Nazis are are predicated on being tough and manly. And so right. the weaponization of victimhood. Yeah, it is. It's a similar phenomenon to white tears. Yeah, definitely. So what did you do when and that's if, when and if you ran into I I know you've in the past said like writer's block is bullshit. It's not real, but at least when I'm writing there, there are days when I don't get much out and then there are days when things flow smoothly. So what do you do when you run into those periods where it's like, Oh my God, it's not coming out right now. Struggle. I think that's the only answer I have. It's just sometimes it's really hard and you don't get much done. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) That's about it really. So how many drafts did you write of this one? Just two. Okay. Um, and really, the the second draft is fairly similar to the first. I just sort of tightened some things up for a, a couple of secondary characters and 
cut a few scenes for length and things mm. like that. Mm-hmm. Actually, to backtrack for a second, there is one thing I do when I'm stuck. The guy who taught me how to finish a novel, Bill Tapley, who is a, a mystery writer who taught at my college, used to say that when in doubt, you should just kill someone. Mm. Um, <laughs> You know, if there's a body, then you have a way forward. So I do that. If okay. I'm stuck, I start fragging people. And sooner or later, you're going to kill the right person and move the plot. Great. So the solution to writer's block is murder. Yes. Okay. That's good. As in so many areas of life. <laughs> now, did you do any research for this book? I did quite a bit of research. I did a lot of geographical research and I did a lot of reading about food preservation and things. Oh yeah. Like I had to know how long canned food would last because I wanted to write a post-apocalyptic story that took place without canned beans. I'm, I'm, I'm always irritated by canned food in these stories because it's treated as a constant, but it, it It goes bad quite quickly. Yeah. Within four or five years, almost all of it is going to be toxic. Right, right. And And that's assuming it's kept in a cool, dry place and not somewhere warm, not left in the sun. Right. Not getting wet and rusty. That it's all properly sealed, too. Yeah, that nobody drops it and, whoops, a tiny little air pocket got in there. Now all the Mm -hmm. bacteria is just having a party. Exactly. Yeah. So just mostly for aesthetic reasons, I wanted this to be a novel where people had to secure their own food and hunt and gather. Right. So I had to figure out a bunch about cooking and food preservation. I learned that maple syrup can potentially stay drinkable and fresh for like a hundred years if you store it in a cool place in glass. Wow. Yeah. Isn't that nuts? That's cool. Yeah. Um, I learned a lot about smoking meat. I learned so much about compound bows. Yeah. Bow and arrow is is the weapon of choice in this one, I guess, because it's quieter than a gun. Yeah, exactly. You know, if you fire a gun, you're going to have 40 or 50 men coming down on you. Yeah, that was something I appreciated about the book, that there's concern, you're thinking about noise, like so many, so many zombie stories, everyone's just got guns, and they have infinite bullets. And there's no concern about making noise. Yeah, I actually despise zombie fiction in general. I mean, it has it has its exceptions. I love 30 days or 28 days later. I love the Romero Zombie movies, oh, yeah. Dawn of the Dead, Day of the Dead, Night of the Living Dead. But in general, big cultural tent poles like The Walking Dead and World War Z are really like sort of fascist jerk off material. Yeah. Like there's a lot we... of that reactionary fantasy there. Exactly. And, and it's baked in right at the most basic level because, first off, the people these stories are about are almost uniformly white cis able-bodied beautiful people right which i think sucks because it's it's kind of this quiet like passive eugenicism yeah and it's wildly unrealistic too the idea that an affluent suburbanite would be able to function after the apocalypse when like dude they can't even function if their local starbucks is out of coffee (laughs) you're gonna fucking you, you they can't function when like whole foods is on strike yeah, but yeah, this, you can live without electricity. No fucking problem. This woman whose voice regularly hits 100 decibels when someone forgets her caramel shot and her macchiato right. is definitely going to be a real badass after civilization collapses. I have no illusions that I could survive the end of civilization. I would fucking die. Oh Zero my God. question. I am dead. I am not going to make it. It would be a miracle if I made it through a day. Yeah, just, it would not happen. I would stub my toe, get sepsis, and die. Yes. Immediately. 100%. <laughs> um. Okay, but getting getting back to the writing process, let's see, research. How about sketching characters? Did you, like, sketch out characters or just sort of 
play it by ear and let them speak to you? Well, they're fake people who don't exist. Right. So I did not let them speak to me. I told them who they were. (laughs) And then I ruined their lives. Nice. And then I killed some of them. (laughs) Because that's what they're for. They're they're little sea monkeys who dance for my amusement. All right. Now, there's that classic bit of writing advice everybody gives and everyone likes to repeat, although I think a lot of people don't really understand what it means. But it's a thing we say, kill your darlings, kill your darlings. Did you have to kill some of your darlings in this process? I actually had to not kill my darlings. Ooh. I know. Very transgressive. Wow. So, I'm sorry, there's a weed whacker going across the street. I don't know if it's coming through. There, you know what? There's somebody honking on my street, so it's fine. That's fine. <laughs> We're even. So when people say "kill your darlings," the most common interpretation I hear is like, "You should not write something indulgent. Hmm. You shouldn't let your your fetishes and your private passions drive the project," which is obviously bullshit because people are really only interesting when they talk about the shit that gets them hot and the shit that freaks them out. Yeah. So that's, that's the zone where I try to stay in. But in this instance, I also think that kill your darlings can kind of mean, I think a lot of people take it to mean don't stray too far from the predictable. In the first draft of this, of this book or sort of the first ideated draft anyway I don't I don't I didn't actually finish it I killed a different character than the one who who wound up dying at the end oh and it read as much more status quo and feel goody Mm. and I I hated it and I I couldn't tell why and then I realized that like I had killed someone who I identified with and felt a lot more about just because I like that's who dies in real life. (laughs) Right. And so I wound up cutting against that and killing someone else. And I think the book is a lot better for it. Hmm. But also, yeah. um, Yeah. On a more general level, this is a very indulgent book. There's a lot of me on the page. I don't know that anyone would necessarily be able to parse it out and figure out like, one-to-one what I'm into and what I hate but yeah why would you write something that's not really personal Let's skip to the publishing process. Your agent took care of a heck of a whole lot of stuff, I'm guessing. He took care of the, let me submit this to the publisher so you don't have to do that shit. Yes. Nice. Um, He did all of that, for which I love him because I suck at that shit. I'm so bad at paperwork. Yeah. It's Um, not much fun submitting stuff and then the waiting game. and. No, it's horrible. It sucks. That's the reason I gave up on it. Yeah. Just waiting um, for months and months and how many people say like, uh, we respond after six months and sometimes or two years and sometimes not at all. And we also <laughs> forbid simultaneous submissions. It's great. So I guess if you don't get it published immediately, you just wait until you die. Yeah. I guess you're supposed to do that. It's, it's literally just that. Guess I'll die. Suck image. Yeah. <laughs> um, but we actually only submitted to one person because he didn't think he could sell it to anyone else. Nice. So we went straight to Kelly O'Connor Lonesome at, at Tor Nightfire. Oh, sorry. Harley. No, <laughs> be good. Okay, sorry. You sent it to uh, Night- Tor Nightfire. Yeah, to Kelly O'Connor Lonesome, who wound up being my editor. And she's been absolutely fantastic. 
Okay. So once it got into her hands and she gave you that, that magic, actually, yes, we do want this letter is there's a process of revisions notes, I guess. Yeah. First I finished the book and then she sent it back to me with notes and I made some changes and this was a, a real first for me. I had never worked with oversight before. Yeah. It can be a painful process, at least for me. Because you there get people definitely... like, suggesting, oh, can you change this? Can you change that? And I'll, I'll read the notes and then go take a walk and then come back the next day. Because <laughs> I get too grumpy. Like, how dare you fucking tell <laughs> me to change something? Yeah, I was fortunate enough that Kelly has a pretty light touch and is very insightful. But it's still really personal. Oh, yeah. You know, like to be told, well, what you decided here doesn't really work. So how about you cut it or change it? And it it was a big disruption to my previous style of writing and work. So it it took some adjustment. Yeah. But I do think that Manhunt is better and tighter because of it. Probably the most painful thing when you get notes back is when they're right. Oh, that's the worst. That's so much worse than when they're wrong. When they're absolutely right, you just get, I, I'm, that, that makes me matter. Yep. <laughs> How yep. dare you? <laughs> I'm thinking of, I'm thinking about a scene that she was absolutely right about and that I wound up cutting. And at the time it really stung. I was like, oh man, I thought this was good. And then once it was gone, I was like, oh, that was fucking terrible. <laughs> yeah. Oh God. Yeah, it is a really stressful process, and you, I don't know if you you develop thick skin, or, or I suppose it is really better for you in the long run to, like, get that ego deflation a little bit, but it, yeah. it's not fun. It's not no, fun. It, it's, it's not uniformly fun, but I really <laughs> like Kelly, and she's been so generous and patient with me. It, it really was a pleasure. Nice. Were there any instances in which you felt you needed to push back to keep your artistic integrity where you had to fight and say, no, I am keeping it this way? I can really only think of one instance where I felt like it's morally important for me to keep this. And that's where a character talks about the propensity of cis women to turn everything that trans women do into predation. Mm. and in a certain uncharitable light you could definitely read it as victim blaming or something yeah but it's not yeah and put 50 trans women in a room they'll all have the same story i see you know we kissed and then later she said that I, my body language intimidated her and now i can't go to the local queer book club or whatever right so i, I felt like i I did have to make a case for that. Yeah. And generally, I'm just, I'm not worried about my book being thorny and not for everyone. It certainly is. Yeah, isn't. clearly not. I mean, it starts with a pair of trans women running across a broken highway with a cooler full of ball sacks that they've cut yep. off men. So this is not a book that's like <laughs> for the adult Steven Universe fans, I guess. No, I couldn't please them if I wanted. So why try? Yeah. Yeah. Now, let's see. Cover art. You mentioned that you hired someone to do cover art for it, but the cover you described is not the one that I'm seeing on the book, that the promotional image is. So where did this new cover art come from? So, like I said earlier, Tom Horseman did the original promotional image, and I loved it and would have really liked to move forward with it, but at tour they have house style and requirements and so that didn't end up working out okay do you have any input into it or do they just say here's here here's what it is there it is i yeah they did give me opportunities for input regularly oh that's um, cool it was cool and who we wound up getting to do the present cover which is the plums in the produce bag right which, you know, it's like great. A, <laughs> looks like a ball sack. Um, <laughs> is Sarah Sitkin, who is a sculptor who did a lot of the monsters for Channel Zero. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> that is so fucking cool. 
that really blew my mind. Channel Zero is one of my favorite shows. The monster the design's work. amazing. The tooth thing? Oh my fucking the god. The tooth thing fucked me up. I don't oh god, it's upsetting. Yeah, it's is, very uh, good. That is that's a pretty fucking unbelievable piece of creature design. Yeah, um, just every anyone anytime you show anyone the tooth thing, they just panic. Yeah. Just a visceral part of your psyche just says no. Yeah, there's a universal I don't like that reaction. Yeah. So she wound up doing the sculpture for us, and I love it. Yeah, that's awesome. Now, I, I understand that maybe in the old days, publishers did a lot of marketing and promotion for books, but these days it's in the hands of writers a heck of a whole lot more than it used to be. And from what I can tell, you're getting a lot of buzz for this book. Some pretty major writers are, are tweeting about it. it. It's ending up on like, here's some upcoming novels. You got to check out lists. How, how, how did you do that? Well, uh, I have been very lucky and Tor actually has put a fair amount of promotional weight behind it. I work with a couple of people there. One is Sarah Pannenberg. They've been really great. And I can't recall the name of the, the like press liaison. The first step was reaching out to a bunch of writers and mm -hmm. seeing if they would be interested in providing a cover quote. And I, mm -hmm. I, I, I was really proactive about that. Um, well, that's good. I was lucky enough to have a, a fairly sizable Twitter following and to have some big names among it. So, yeah, that's handy. Yeah. And I was also lucky enough that some of those people were willing and able to read the book. And yeah, that's cool. Talk about it. The big early win was Carmen Maria Machado. Yeah. Which kind of blew my hair back. Yeah, when I saw Carmen Maria Machado like talking about the book, I'm like, holy shit, you've made it. Yeah, that was a really big moment for me. And as I've often said, mine is surely the only novel with cover quotes from both Carmen Maria Machado and Felix Biederman from Chapo Chapo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you got Felix too. That is a pretty wild collection, I think. Yeah. Felix is a really nice guy. Just very sweet, observant. Oh, that's great. So yeah, that, that I think was the biggest part of getting buzz moving it was just finding those people who were willing to put their own names next to mine. And part of it, I think is just that people are really hungry for trans genre fiction. There's been a lot of trans literature, but very little trans fiction, like genre. Yeah. And, and Manhunt is pulp. Oh you know, yeah. It's, it's, it's trash. And I mean that in a loving way, because I think, <laughs> I think it was, Chesterton who said that literature is a luxury but fiction is a necessity and I think that's very true mm. we need to eat this stuff to keep our self image intact and healthy and I think I'm, I'm really sort of stepping into the field at a moment when people are ready for what I'm, I'm writing Nice. so I'm very lucky in that way I also had the good fortune of coming out fairly quickly after the runaway success of Tori Peters yeah, transition baby yeah which yeah was like, that book is huge yeah it was a dam breaker that was a on the fucking oprah's book club list oh wow do you think manhunt will get on to oprah's book club list i mean i won't say no because the road was on there wow yeah i mean oprah's book club is is not fucking around oprah oprah's a real one wow yeah so Oprah, if you're listening to this, yeah. to Oprah, call me. Book. Yeah, just shoot me a DM. <laughs> wow, it just occurred to me, Oprah's not on Twitter, is she? I don't think so. Good that for her. That is so smart. That she doesn't so need smart. that shit. No. Why would She's you a... need that? She has her own magazine. You don't need Twitter. God, there's a smart, rich person who is not constantly telling us her inner thoughts so that we hate her now. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah, I don't, um, I don't understand why rich people who are actually famous go on Twitter and like share thoughts. That just seems like you're, you're the cost benefit analysis you would do. It's bananas. <laughs> yeah. Do you remember when, um, I think it was a couple of months ago or maybe a little less, 
when that stuff came out about Chrissy Teigen trying to right bully a younger actress into suicide. Right. And a few weeks later, she was back online complaining about how sad it was to be canceled. It's so strange to me. She is a rich lady with a really gorgeous, successful husband, children, a mansion, servants, beautiful, exciting, famous friends. Like, why the fuck would you want attention from Twitter? <laughs> you have, why is the, most you have the life everyone wants. Why are you here? <laughs> well, I think it's because the life everyone wants is joyless and empty. Um, so is Twitter. Oh, for sure. <laughs> it's worse. It's so much worse. But at least it makes a lot of noise. Yeah. You know, it, it's like one of those... Um, do you remember Bop It from yes. the 90s? Yes, it's I like, do. Like, I am a 90s it just, child. It just goes faster and faster and more and more. <laughs> and there's no upper limit. So I got to bring it back to the writing process. What's some <laughs> stuff that you didn't know that you would have to do during this process? Some stuff that blindsided you and you went, oh shit, I got to do that? I didn't, I, oh. <laughs> like I said, the outline. Yeah. It also didn't register for me that I'd like be on panels and be asked to make appearances and things like that. Mm. And also when I got the deal, I wasn't really thinking about being edited, having oversight. Other than that, I think it was a, a fairly typical experience. It was a lot like writing my other books, except much faster. Yeah. That, that was the big thing, is that I was not prepared for how quickly I would have to produce the book. Yeah, yeah. It seems like it came out super fast. Like, how long did it take just to publish this between this getting to your to your agent and then this coming out and stuff? Well, I know it hasn't come out just yet, but... Right. It, it's February 22nd, 2022. Right. Oh, boy. I think I got agented in early 2020 right as the pandemic was no i got agented in early 2020 before the pandemic hit i got the contract right as the pandemic started oh weird yeah it was very surreal to like be succeeding as the world crumbled right because you feel a little guilty or you can't really brag you're going like oh boy this cool thing just happened someone's like my grandma just fucking died yeah it was you're doing okay it was incredibly fucking bizarre and like sort of suspended. I couldn't celebrate with my friends or anything like that. I was just like, hooray. <laughs> yeah. Not that it wasn't exciting. I was basically knocked over backwards, but what was I talking about? Uh, the, the how long it all took. Oh, right, 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 right. And then I, I think that I had a final draft by fall of 2020. Wow. Yeah. That's incredibly fast. It sure was. That's, that's, I couldn't, I don't know. I couldn't imagine doing that. It takes me like a year to write a short story. Yeah. Um, it, it, it definitely took a minute off my life. Yeah. No kidding. But I enjoyed it. Yeah. Wow. So can we talk a little bit about money? You've mentioned it in the past, but I, I think it's important for writers to talk about it just because people have especially aspiring writers have a very unrealistic idea of how much money you actually make from publishing fiction a lot of normal people have this idea that oh you publish a novel you're going to be a millionaire uh no no it is astonishing how little writers actually make if you add up the hours you put into it versus what you get out you're definitely working for less than minimum wage most of the time absolutely so are you comfortable talking about what was your advance royalties that sort of thing yeah for sure i don't know the the royalty structure that i got off the top of my head but i remember that when i compared it to going rates it was very competitive connor really went to bat for me nice he also made sure that i retained the movie rights Ooh, good yeah so money I signed a $50,000 contract for Manhunt and a a then unnamed second novel. Oh, wow. And the way that breaks down, first of all, 15% goes to my agent. Second, upon signing, I got sent 10K, which broke down to 8.5 for me and 1.5 for Connor and Fuse. 
And then upon manuscript completion, I got sent another five. Okay. When and if Manhunt makes more than $20,000 in the market, I will be sent the remaining 10. Okay. And then the same structure applies with my second novel. All right. So that, so that is a tidy sum, but again, this is, you said, what, 50K for two years, if at least, of work, so. It, yeah. At, yeah. At, <laughs> and it's also, it's, the actual delivery will be spread out over, like, four years. Right, right, because it takes a while for a book to earn money. Yes. So, to break it down, first of all, this was immediately the most money I had ever had in my life. Right. Second, when you spread it out over four years and account for all the work that I'm doing, it is not enough to live on. No. I'm very lucky that I have a successful Patreon and a dedicated reader base. That's how I make the bulk of my living. I make less in four years than my friend who is a librarian makes in one. Oof. Yeah. Librarians that that are not rich they're not known (laughs) that famous member of the petite bourgeois (laughs) Um, wow so there's there's not a lot of money in publishing the like great big out of nowhere success story i can call to mind is bizarrely elizabeth costova's the historian which is an extremely long boring dry dracula story from the mid 2000s huh and she was paid a million dollars up front, which was tremendous, huge, unheard of. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. And in the mid 2000s. Yeah. Not not in the 80s, not Stephen King times. Right. This was long after the cocaine had stopped flowing. In the right. World. And then I think she got another million once it earned out, which is crazy. And they promoted the shit out of that book. They spent like... Three hundred thousand dollars on marketing. Wow! It was so surreal. I wonder, um, does she have connections? How many babies did she throw into the mouth of the giant mammon statue? Right. This I have I questions. How did I that do, happen? I do not know how she connects to the world of money. I would not be surprised if she did. Just extremely, extremely weird and anomalous. That kind of thing basically never happens anymore. Yeah. Um, and it earned out, though. That's even weirder to me. Oh, yeah. I think it was basically, not to be uncharitable. I've never, I, I was... don't even know what this book is, so <laughs> I can't be offended. I have no idea what it is. I think it was sort of too big to fail. Yeah, I guess so. Like, it was everywhere. Everywhere. Wow. Yeah, but that is that is not the typical story for most fiction writers, especially like well any kind of any kind of fiction genre or or literary fiction. That's not going to happen to you. Absolutely. If you are writing with the thought like I'm going to be rich and famous, please no, no, you won't stop. No. Go do something else. You're pro- unless... you probably got a better chance like making it big with a Twitch stream or something. Yep. Unless you really love writing, don't do it. Yeah. Or do it just for yourself. Yep. Because the the dividends are not great. Yeah, for the most part. Also, I think that in some ways, self-publishing can be much more lucrative. I can see that. If you have a little bit of business sense, you can make it work much better for yourself, even though you'll be reaching a smaller audience because you get all the money. Yeah. A niche Um, audience. I do know a number of people who have made a comfy living self-publishing various types of fetish porn yes that is that's the way to do it that if you are trying to solely in writing to make money write fetish porn that is your best bet that is absolutely the way to go i have i have friends who support themselves based on fetish porn yep i i know someone who paid for law school with fetish porn and honestly it is a noble undertaking it brings joy into the world you're giving people what they want it's honest it's a career to be respected. Yep. Um, All right. <laughs> I actually, I used to be a sex worker. I did that at the same time that I was copywriting through 2016, 2017, and 2018. And it, it can be nice work if you can get it. 
So let's switch gears and talk a little bit about dealing with some controversy and backlash. Whenever you sneeze, generally whenever a trans woman sneezes very loud, you get immense backlash and, and controversy. And your novel has attracted some controversy for incredibly stupid reasons. I remember a lot of people got mad because you said it excluded trans men, even though it didn't. I was reading the book. And just a couple chapters in, a major character is introduced who's a trans man. And I'm like, wait, she got yelled at for not having <laughs> trans men, but one of the main characters. The f what the fuck? People so, just sort of decide they're going to be mad at you. They are. Yeah, it was very strange and very confusing. But has has the kind of backlash and pushback you've gotten affected your writing, affected your career, affected your mental health? Well, when I first signed, I would say that my mental health was being affected by pushback. Mm -hmm. Online harassment has been a regular for me for years now. Yep. And as I've gotten more prominent, it has gotten worse and louder. Oh, yeah. Do you think that's because you're more visible or do you think there's sort of a crabs in a bucket mentality thing going on? I think on? it's both. I think it's both. For sure, there are other trans people who have maybe some some unprocessed shit of their own when it comes to ideas like visibility and success and so it brings up a lot of strong feelings for them when they see someone else attain those things and their reactions are not always reasonable or sane yeah and i think i'm being pretty generous with that assessment yeah, I think that's a very compassionate assessment, honestly. Um, so at the time, it was causing me a lot of anxiety. I was in a, a bit of a less stable place than I am now. Mm. And it was just challenging to deal with sort of the volume and breadth of abuse that I was having thrown at me every day. Yeah. Because I have to be on Twitter for work. Right. Right. It's where I post my film reviews. It's where I drum up attention for Manhunt. Part of my job is literally just like telling dumb jokes on Twitter. Right. So it can feel kind of inescapable. Yeah. And there's also an element, you know, I'm, I'm a, a person who is prone to wallowing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I have a writer. <laughs> yeah. Who wallows? What? I know, it's unbelievable. I have what? major depressive disorder. Um, no. <laughs> yeah, I know, it's a shocker. And I also have body dysmorphic disorder, which is a, a sort of subspecies of OCD. So Ooh. I do have... Body dysmorphia fucking sucks. It's oh, awful. It's, oh, it's damn. It's definitely the mental illness I have that has been hardest for me to handle. And it also leads to a fair amount of compulsive behavior. Oh, yeah. Um, so there were, have been times where I would like name search myself and oh, just no. stare at all the awful things that people were saying about me and just soak in it. Ooh. Because it, on some level, it feels affirming to have hundreds or thousands of strangers being like, look at this evil freak. Yeah. Um, I, I, that kind of makes sense. Like, oh, the, the angry voice that's telling me this shit turns out the voice is telling me the truth. So yeah, yeah. that means in a weird way, I'm not crazy, which is yeah. weirdly affirming in a, in a shitty way. Right. It's, it's affirming to the parts of yourself that you should really be pruning. Ex yeah. Yep. Um, you know, we, we talk about personal growth like it's a, an unquestioned good, but uh, you can grow the wrong parts. Some some personal reduction isn't bad. Yes. Some sometimes you you can cut that thing off. Yes, you, you, really you, you take that to the doctor and and get it chopped off. Yeah. Or something. Or at, least, <laughs> at least lanced. Yeah. Um. You you go to Doctor Sandra Lee and yeah. have it dealt with. <laughs> so I had to really throttle back and develop some sort of self-defense mechanisms like blocking instantly when someone starts shit with me yeah and that has been effective at, at reducing the anxiety quite a bit yeah i'm i'm online less than i used to be I'm, oh that's good 
And that's yeah. uh, that is a feat during the pandemic too, when oh, like Jesus online Christ. is everything. Is it ever? <laughs> I'm looking at at less of this this garbage than I used to, and I, I still slip up sometimes. I actually, recently got back into therapy for, to get some support with it. That's good. Yeah. Well, the strain that targets me is so intense and so virulent. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's weird. You see people who are just obsessed with hating you? There are people who tweet about me pretty much nonstop. Yeah, I I don't understand caring this much about another person at all. Yeah. I it's don't think so... this much about people I actually like. Right. It's really intense. Like, you're, you're not well if you're thinking... And again, it's a random writer. It's not like you have your finger on the big red button that controls the nukes or whatever. Right. You are... I'm not. I'm not even Stephen King. I'm, yeah. I'm one one hundred thousandth of Stephen King, and that's being extremely generous. Right. My cultural reach is tiny. Yeah. And I am in no way geopolitically significant. Right. But there, there is a subset of people who seem to believe that the most important thing they could do is brutalize me into killing myself. Yeah. And the only solution really is to not care about them and shut them out yeah. as much as possible. Um, yeah. Every way. Yeah. Cause it's not like you're going to reason with the person who genuinely spends 10 hours a day tweeting about you. There's not anything you can say that'll make them go like, maybe you should go outside. Right. Like, you know, it's got to be on that person to make that decision and you can't force them to do that. Absolutely. There's there's no version of reality where you convince the person having some kind of low key psychotic episode to stop obsessing with you. Yeah. So I, I, I see that you you despite this, you've taken maybe a step back, but you in the past haven't been afraid to be confrontational and outspoken. And at least my perception of you is that you've got a fairly thick skin all things considered? Yeah, I would say that I do, sort of by necessity. I'm, I'm a pretty sensitive person. Yeah, again, but, writer. Yeah, <laughs> but I've, I've had to build up a callus about what strangers think of me. It can't matter to me or I'll go insane. Yeah. You've got your own way of coping with it. Do you ever think that this kind of backlash or the threat of this kind of backlash can have an effect on other queer writers, especially trans women writers, because at, it, at least it's my perception that trans women seem to attract way more of this shit. Yeah, I think that's correct. It certainly lines up with my own perception. And I, I know that it has an effect on other trans women writers. I would say that it does not affect me, but it has definitely made me meaner and more willing to be disgusting in what I write. <laughs> Just because no matter what I do, they'll get mad at me. Right. So I might as well do exactly what I want. Yeah. But I've heard from so many trans women who are like, I'm too afraid of this to make the work that I want to make. Or yeah. I've been convinced by this that I'll be a bad person if I make it. And to have the bar for entry into a creative field be you have to be able to withstand hundreds of people calling you a pedophile and spreading insane rumors about how you tried to murder someone. That's, that's nuts. That's I unreasonable. Mean, you, yes, it Most is. Most normal that's, people aren't going to look at that and go, I, yeah, let me do that. Yeah. Let me it do that really, in exchange for writing a story that gives me very little money per hour. Yeah, yeah yes. absolutely. Basically nothing. To have that be the barrier for entry is so hateful and destructive. And I, I know that who knows how many trans women are being cut out of a field that they could really contribute to. Yeah. And that they should be able to. And it, it breaks my heart. Yeah. Do you think it's harder, the fact that so, so much, at least so much of this backlash and controversy that I see comes from people who appear to be queer themselves yes i think it sucks i think that the entire queer community has a lot of reckoning to do with trans misogyny in a way that they have no interest in doing right now we live in a time when an individual person has next to no agency 
and is being squeezed like a fucking rotten grape until they pop in the hand of our society every single day. It is really hellish in a lot of ways to be alive at this time. And I think that frustration naturally flows downhill until it finds the path of least resistance. Right. And so often that path is trans women. Yeah. In many situations, in many social circles, even to each other, very often we are garbage. Yeah. And we get treated like garbage. If we do something that makes someone upset, then we should be thrown away and we should never have another friend and we shouldn't have jobs. I mean, when I got my book deal, people called my publisher and my agent and told them to drop me. Wow. Yeah. Wow. When I got picked up, my agent had to explain to my editor, like, every time you tweet about this woman, you're going to hear from a dozen of the craziest people you've ever met telling you the most outlandish shit. She's a murderer. Right. Wow. But you have a book deal and they don't. Yeah, I do. Suck it. And that (laughs) brings me to to my final point on these clowns, which is that they're powerless. They didn't stop you. No, they didn't. In fact, and and this is is just between you and me, folks. Controversy sells. Yeah, I found out that too with our podcast. Like every time somebody, some group of hashtag M writing Twitter gets mad at me, I end up gaining about 100 followers and getting a couple more subscribers to the Patreon. That is precisely how it works. Um, (laughs) I remember when serious online harassment of me kicked off. It was when I wrote that article, I don't want to grow up and neither can you. Oh, that's a great article. I love that one. Thank you. I really feel like I'm going to flatter myself here. Yeah, Yeah, that that is comforting that they can't, as as much noise as they make, they didn't stop you. They're not, they don't really have that much power, all that. No, they don't. Really something I think to keep in mind if you're, if you're listening and you're thinking about publishing, like... It, yeah, if I you could can still do it, <laughs> speak to any trans women who are listening, who who might want to make something that they think could get them flack, do it, yeah. do it, and immediately block anyone who says boo about it. And in the end, you'll have a book, and they'll have a list of people they've screamed out on the internet. <laughs> Universally, these people do not fucking make anything. Yeah. Well, occasionally, uh, occasionally they make really, really mediocre science fiction. Oh my um, God. But, <laughs> but you can still ignore them. They're still not that powerful. They anyway. really aren't. Yeah, it, it, it's kind of extraordinary. It's a lot of paper tigers for the most part. Okay, so before we wrap it up, we've been talking for a while. Uh, is there anything else you want to say about the writing process of this book? It was hard. If you can get another job, do that instead. <laughs> okay. That's it. <laughs> That's it. Get get another job. Don't write. That is Gretchen Felker Martin's official advice to writers. Just don't. Just don't. Don't not do even it. once. <laughs> Great advice. Okay. So when is the book coming out again and where can people order it or pre order it? February twenty second, two thousand twenty two is the official release date. Um, you can pre-order it in print or as an ebook from pretty much any online outlet. Just search Manhunt Gretchen Felker Martin and right away the pre-order portals will pop up. What I would really love is if you pre-ordered it through your local bookstore. Yeah. Fuck that's, Amazon. That's Jeff show. Bezos is the devil. Yes. Yeah. Fuck Amazon. Yeah, local bookstores are cool. Yes, they are. Yeah. So that is it for part one. To hear part two, where we talk about the book in greater detail and probably spoil the shit out of it, sign up for the book club at patreon.com slash write good. And until next time, keep writing good. This has been Write Good with Raquel S. Benedict. Hosted by Raquel S. Benedict and produced by Matt Keeley for KS Media LLC. Theme song by Surgery Head. This has been a Kitty Sneezes production. For comments and concerns, please write to us at writegood at kittysneezes.com. That is R-I-T-E-G-U-D at kittysneezes.com. 
If you'd like to support us, please visit our Patreon at patreon.com slash right good. Kittysneezes.com in color. <laughs> <laughs>